Hello everyone, so I'm Eloisa and I'm your Vice President for Reps and Volunteers. Um, I just wanted to introduce this, this night of films because this is quite a special night because all these films have been made by um, Edinburgh Napier film graduates that graduated this year and these are a series of short films that they've made uh, while they were studying at Napier. So it is quite exciting. Um, a lot of these are not, they're actually these are, are not available to, to see on YouTube normally. So this is quite an exclusive thing. And I hope that you'll really enjoy it because it, it's really nice to actually get to see something that the students from, from your same university are have done. So as well, I'll, I'll be introducing each film just to let you know a little bit what they're about. There's a bit of everything. Um, I also wanted to let you know as well that um, most of these films, well, these films don't have subtitles. Uh, just because they were made by the film students and just as a, a little disclaimer um some of them have quite a strong scottish accent as well so if you are an international student you might not understand everything but you will get you know you are in edinburgh you will get used to it so um you get quite quickly accustomed to accents so yeah the, the first film that we're going to see actually is called toy stories and it is a little documentary film it's quite fun and it talks about childhood toys, childhood memories. So that, that's, quite, that's quite nice and relatable. Um, and then after that, we were going to watch a film called Eva. And that one's a bit more of a mystery with themes around love affairs and suicide. And obviously I won't give too much away because these films are quite short as well. So they, they speak for themselves. And after this one, we have another short film that is called Chicken and the Tramps. And this one is quite a funny one about two homeless guys that are looking for fried chicken in the street. So that one will be quite good. Uh, following that one, we have another film called Rem Phase. Uh, that one has a small trigger warning because it has a sleeping pill addiction uh, in it, just to let you know. Um, and so this is about a girl that gets a sleep, uh, addicted to sleeping pills and then tries to chase her dreams while she is sleeping. After that one, we have another mystery film, a uh, mystery crime uh, that is called The Curious Case of the Murdered Malt. And that one's quite good because you get to see uh, it shot in some of the streets of Edinburgh as well. Um, after that, we have one called Decibel Sentinels. That one also is quite good because it is set in Bainfield, the student accommodation. So if you are a new student, you might be staying there. So it'll be quite good to, to see a film that, uh, that is shot in your student accommodation. And if you were if you're a returning student, then you might have been there when you were in first year. So I was that that's where I lived when I was uh, at Napier in my first year. So when I watched that film, it brought back some good memories as well of just hanging around around the block of flats. And then the last one that we're going to watch is a documentary about the Edinburgh Co-op. So the Edinburgh Co-op is a student housing cooperative um, that's uh, in Brunsfield. So it is a place where about 300 students live and they are all co-tenants of, uh, of the accommodation. So it is really interesting, um, an, an interesting place and it will show you a bit about how it works. And actually, if you are interested in the student co-op, you can actually look up on their website as well uh, and see how they work, because I, I think it's it's a really great place. But but yeah, without further ado, I will I will let the films run. And I really hope that you enjoy them. And if you do enjoy them, uh, just leave a little comment as well. Let us know what you thought. And yeah, so let's go with the first film is Toy Stories. What matters about objects? What's interesting about objects? Why does little things matter so much? Why do people hoard things? And why do people hoard things? That's an interesting point. There's some sort of memory attached to it, I think. Well, what do you mean? I was just kind of enamored by the fact that I had this toy given to me by my granddad. And I've never really known him. I, I just had this sort of feeling that I should never throw it out. Because, you know, he died when I was pretty much a baby. So I just, I've barely known him. I've got something kind of like that. I was thinking about my, my granddad, my pop-up, as I call him, Americans. <laughs> but yeah, he like made this kind of rocking chair. It's like an airplane, I guess, like because he made it for me. And it's a plane, I always like saw it. I was like, oh, you know, it's for when I go to see him, I fly in the little plane. And it's got extra value because he made it for me and then sent it all the way over from America. Oh yeah, that sort of thing. Got a lot of board. Yeah, write my thing up, bigger than David's. 
What's the big deal with your toy? It's special because it's the only existing memory that I have of my grandfather. My dad and my grandmother always look at it and can always recall stories about them. And I think they've always made a point of keeping it. And I suppose that's kind of important to them. And you wish you had that? I mean, yeah, that would be nice, yeah. What kind of toy is it? Uh, it's a Humpty Dumpty toy. It's like a, it has a little bell in it. From where? Um, I want to say, like, boots or something. <clears throat> Mine's a homemade, so, you know. When you were young, everybody knew you were Andy Lowe's grandson because... They didn't need to be told. You were so like him. People used to say, oh, it's your dad's double all the time. No, oh, he's like Andy all the time. Is there any particular memory of me and Papa that you have? The one I, the one I like is when we, when we they had a caravan. And one of the times we went down there was the first time that you were ever in the sea. He shouted, take his socks and shoes off because I'm going to take him for his first paddle. Trouser legs rolled up in, in the water and he loved it. And you can see on your face in the pictures and the photographs that you loved it as well. I know that day I brought the video camera. The really frustrating thing is that I don't, I can't find the tape with the video footage on it. Does he have it? <laughs> That's what you're saying. Like he was like he's lost that tape. Oh, Dad's always like that. Isn't he? <laughs> That's probably the only, the only video footage of you and your grandfather together. That would be great to see that again. You know, and I, I've mislaid it. Don't know what I've done with it. How did he lose it? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Mum. How's it going? Hi, dear. You know the, the rocking chair in the the office? Um, uh, no. You know, the pop-up maid? What rocking chair? The green one with the, like, maroon paint, you know, and the wing broke off, and then we kept it there in that corner. The airplane? Yeah, yeah. The rocking airplane? Yeah, well, pop-up never made that, dear. What? I got that at John Lewis. What? You told me you made it, Mum. No, he made a rocking horse for Zane, but the, again, that was oh, a couple what? years ago. So my cousin gets this amazing rocking chair, and I get something crap from John Lewis. I don't believe it. Is that what you think of then, when you see that toy? Yeah, because he bought that he bought that toy very soon after you were born. He came in from work one day, just out of the blue, and handed a wee parcel to you. Well, you couldn't open it, so I opened it, and it was this wee Humpty Dumpty. Every day after that, when he came in, he would come over, I would be sitting here with you, and he would sing Humpty Dumpty song to you. He did it every day for weeks and weeks and weeks, and one day he smiled back at it. And then he started to try and move your hands like he was doing to Humpty Dumpty, sit in the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great ball. <laughs> all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again, and you would go again. <laughs> All right, guys, we made it to John Lewis. Gonna go in, film, find that toy. Let's go. I swear that I was told this was handmade. It's not like it's that far-fetched. It's not on the John Lewis website, it's nowhere. My mom's lying, not my granddad. We're going home, we're right. gonna find it. <laughs> as well. It's missing both these propellers and these wing things. I would, I would sit on it and it was up upstairs in the computer room where like my brothers would like hang out and watch TV or play games or something and then I would always get the bad seat which would be this seat. I, I don't believe it's not homemade still. Like it doesn't say, it doesn't say John Lewis anywhere. What does that say? There's just a bunch of scratches. It looks like it says Wank. <laughs> it's literally. For fuck's sake, look. You see that? Uh, the scratching's here. Who did this? <sighs> I mean, the toy's ruined. It says wank on it. One of the reasons he bought that particular toy was my sister, Andy. You know, he used to call him Humpty. When he saw that, he, I, I think he thought of the the nickname that Andy had given him. 
you thought that's the thing, you know, I think that hung in your pram forever. And once you were a bit older, you used to kind of bat it, make it, make the, make the bell go. It was always there. And I think after he was gone, we made a point of hanging it there all the time. Yeah. And that's why it's so significant because he bought it on his own and it hung and we wanted it to be there. What yeah. a nice memories I'm giving you. Yeah. With that. That I don't even know you had that still. Yeah, look oh, how, yeah, got, I think I've got look how before, proud yeah. he looked to you and happy yeah. to have my grandson. Yeah. I just kind of wish I knew more. I do yeah. too. Yeah. You say you got the toy at John Lewis. I had a look at it. I can't see any John Lewis logo. Do you actually remember getting the toy? Yes. When? My dad and I did. Before I was born? No, I think you were born. I really don't remember. You I just think said you, yes. <laughs> I think you were born. I mean, we didn't get it necessarily for you. It was for the three of you, really. <laughs> well, I was the only one that used it. I think what happened was we got it when you were a baby, but we kind of expected that your brothers would play for, with it first, and then you would kind of grow into it. I'd get the hang me down. Well. I've come here to just roll around in my own disappointments. Well, I don't think you should be disappointed. Does the fact that, you know, you just bought it from John Lewis make it less special than, you know, if you made it for me? Like Not to me it doesn't, because I, I only think of you guys playing on it and the fun that you had, and you really enjoyed it. In reality, I wish I knew my grandfather more. I've gained a much greater insight into who he was as a person. I think I'll keep the toy with me. Um, I think this is going to stay with me for quite a while.
Are you okay? It's so late. Uh, yeah, they needed help cleaning up, so I volunteered. We can't keep doing so many shifts. You can't. Bother. Helen, please, not now. I've got a lecture tomorrow, and I barely slept probably in a week. You should take some pills. There's loads left from the last exam. Hey, hey, I made your breakfast. Just sleep well. Oh, I had this. Room and it was just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Oh yeah? What was it? I I don't know. I mean it's crazy because I know it was beautiful, but I don't remember it. Well, it's good to see you back in your feet. thinking about their condition and they're having a seizure, then that's, it can be really, really harmful for their condition. Shouldn't you be at work? I, uh, I've got a day off and so Good for you. I'm going. See you tomorrow. Bye. No, I just had a bad dream. <laughs> Couldn't find a nice one again, eh? At least you're getting some sleep. Just go easy on the pills, though. You start feeling like shit very soon. I know I did. Like shit. Did you sleep all day? Mm. Here, eat something. Phoebe! That's enough. You have to stop taking those pills, okay? Just get off my back, Helen. What? Do you want to take away the only chance I have to find my dream again? To be happy. To be happy to join the date. Oh. Have you lost your mind? to hurt yourself, that's all. Can we talk about this? Can you stop for fuck's sake? Hey!
Come on, you fucking psycho. Let's get you up here. Listen up, Phoebe. Can you do that for me? Just try to stay awake. You have to stop this madness, okay? This is killing you. I'm not okay with that. Do you understand? You don't need to chase a stupid dream. Whatever you think you'll find there, you're gonna have it here. Because I'm here for you. I did. I had a dream again. And you're in it too. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to go to the So, how is Russia? Cold. Afraid of Russia. Yes, in Russia it's very cold. Communist? Me? No, no, no communist. Manji bambino? It doesn't matter. Eat the children. No, not only we not eat children. In Russia we not eat anything. This is big problem. No, 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 this is ragun, non è pomodoro. Tesoro mio, parla con tuo padre. Papà! Senti, Lore, non è che possiamo cucinare sempre cose a parte, perché tu sei vegetarista. Mamma, ma digli qualcosa, lo senti? Lo dico, siediti con posto, togli i comiti dal tavolo e... So, did you hear that Katie Williams? Katie Williams? About the... Um, frullatore, come si dice? Yeah. Yeah, so what happened is that the... Oh. Archie, we not invite you. Non ti abbiamo invitato. Well, actually, I came to take my money. Quali money? Oh. Oh. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you. 
The number is six. I won! No. I won. If you don't give me my money now, I'm going to tell everyone some secret facts about you. Which facts? Your father loves Marmite and beans on toast for breakfast. Ha, how do you know? I know about the turkey. Turkey? Papa dagli soldi. No way. You get soldi, don't you know? Your girlfriend eats turkey in the middle of the night. Laura, is he telling the truth? I, I can explain. This is not how it seems. <laughs> she wakes up after Graziella has eaten three or four donuts from the fridge. Using plant extracts, Frylight blends oil with water to create a fine layer with just a few sprays. So you can cook with 95% less fat. Frylight. Feel good fry. Mamma, mangi le bisambelle? Ah, lo sapevo. Altro che dirti, eh? Ho fame a quell'ora. Non so mai che mangiare. <laughs> and she uses all... No, of... Archie, you can't do this to me. Then give me my money. Archie, spaghetti all I have. You can have spaghetti at any time. Whole year, tutto l'anno. I'll think about it. You give me spaghetti now. And I'll give you an extension. It's a deal. But I'll come back next week. Kilo Mike zero four. We have reports of a code two six southwest city center. Soco and CID supervisor required. Code two six. Suspicious circumstances. Over. Uh, don't know. Can't think. Who who would want to do something so inhumane? Where's the body? It's a truly disgusting crime. Now, if you don't mind, myself and my colleague need to have a wee look around. Our man outside will take care of everything else. Where is it? What? The victim? Over there. Don't touch anything. That there is our victim. Tragedy. Such a fine single malt. But so no murder? If you ask me, it might as well be murder. Wasting whiskey like that. A fucking bottle of whiskey? It's not about the whiskey. It's about what the whiskey represents. This is Edinburgh in a bottle. The experience of the city distilled into 70 centilitres. The tarnishing of this drink might as well be the tarnishing of old Ricky herself. If it's not safe, no one is. A homeless man froze to death outside my flat last night. What Jesus fuck are you talking about? I'm trying to teach you something important about your home here. No, this might be important to you, but I, I'm a man of the people. Oh, aye? Aye. Well, a bottle of this stuff can go for over 20,000. 20? Now, if we can get back to the job at hand, tell me what you make of the crime scene. Well, I see that doesn't seem to be any sign of forced entry, and there's one smashed bottle of expensive poison. Is that the only high value damage? Nope. 
One smashed, one stolen, one left behind. One smashed, one stolen. Dude, what if the other one was to go missing as well? Well, like I said, it was left behind. Suspect must have missed it. I no, I hear you. But what if they took it? Does Pub Boy know about the other bottle in the bar? I'm going to pretend like I don't know where this is going. No, look, the owner must have insurance on something like this, yeah? I must be due a big payout. Do you like him for the suspect? Maybe, but while this is a tragedy, yeah, a real tragedy, he's not likely to suffer from it, is he? Well, no, but... I so, you could say... If another bottle were to go missing, it could help the victim. Are you actually counting out the possibility we might solve this crime? 20 grand. That's a lot of money. Especially for two lowly paid public sector employees. Duncan, what you're talking about goes against everything we are meant to represent. It's, well, it's wrong. Aye, and so's paying my rent late every month, but it still happens. Just stop me any time, Sergeant. One smashed, two stolen. Now what? What do you want me to do with that? Buy it. <laughs> so... You're not here to arrest me, then? No. Should we be? No. Good. <laughs> Are you going to buy the fucking thing, then? If it is what you say it is, then I'm interested. I'll give you ten grand for it. Ten? ten? Fucking what? That's worth twenty grand. That's what happens when you sell it on the black market. <laughs> no. No, Duncan McCann, said anything less than 20 grand, it's not worth it. Fine, fine. I'll pay the 20, but I'm not handing over a penny until I've verified its quality. Well, how do you do that? By tasting it. Oh, <laughs> soft. Settle down. Why? This is piss. This is a bottle of Tesco's finest. <laughs> well, Tesco wouldn't lie about that, would they? Get out and take your piss water with you. I better not be a smile on your face. Tesco's finest. Oh, fuck off. Tesco's finest for Edinburgh's finest. 20 grand, Raymond. You realise you were right about one thing, though? Your man at the pub, you must have staged it. Well, I said that. You must have swapped the contents of the bottle, smashing one in the process, then he put the other one back Raymond. on the bar. But that doesn't explain why. Raymond, I don't give a fuck, yeah? I stopped caring the moment that I got whiskey spat in my face. <sighs> 20 grand! You wouldn't know what to do with the money even if you got it. I would. Oh, I Feed the homeless. Well, maybe. Hey, what would you do with it? I'd buy myself a fine single malt. Aye, you read. Oh, fuck. <coughs> That's horrible. We are Wandsworth Student Accommodation. We are protected by the Sentinels. 
The sentinels keep us silent because silence is peace. The sentinels are blue because they cry for our sins. The sentinels listen, they do not intrude. Hi. How are you this Friday evening? Good. Would you like to repeat the four essential principles? Um, um, below 60 decibels and all will be well. Uh, if you give a warning above 60, you'll be a superhero. Don't use the device unless you've been trained. Well, that doesn't rhyme. It goes, new stats used on the device is not allowed, even when it's loud. Sorry. Very new stats, like you. We like to keep it to our three strikes you out policy. That's strike one. Okay. Do you like football? Damn. Stay put. Okay. Sorry, but the person you've called isn't available at the moment. Just speak after the time. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't want to put this on you, man, but I fucking... Strike to Matilda. Get back to your workstation. I can't do it anymore. Wait. Are we going to help him? Help him. Matilda? Give me the evening. I think I'm going to go inside. This is your last warning. <laughs> Matilda! <laughs> it is essential rule number four. I can do it. I can do it! We are here in my house, in my room, in Edinburgh Student House and Cooperative, which was set three and a half years ago by lovely students like me in Edinburgh. We don't have landlords, or we are our own landlord, so I am my landlord, with other 105 people who live in these red houses. between cooperative and student housing but student housing it's it's usually for one year only maybe more there are very strict rules you can't paint walls you can't put the screw in the wall you can't attach extra hook even if it feels like it whereas here it's different so it's like you can do everything at co-op like as long as you like make sure that everyone's okay and you don't demolish anything i haven't made any extra shelves but let's say in our kitchen uh, I felt that we need more shelves, you know, for any kind of cutlery or like rice cookers or other things. And uh, essentially, everyone in co op has made one shelf or something, you know, contributed, or let's say the murals on the walls, you know, just like coloring, make it, let's say, colorful, nicer. At the beginning, when the co op started, uh, four, four groups were, were formed people, participation, procedures, and places. Places has been busy with the renovation of basements for the past year. So we have six six basement workers that yeah the co-op agreed to agreed to pay them. They just do an amazing job every day. 
considering that they're non-professionals. You get these works that um, you go to a contracting company in total, where you're probably paying 17 or 18 pounds an hour per person because there's also management fees and they've also got profit make on top of the labor costs. You, you, we're in a position, if we can do things ourselves, we can save a tremendous amount of money. Yep. Tens of thousands. People come in here not really even knowing how to use a drill and they usually, everybody leaves knowing a bit more. And you do that just by living here, which is, I think, a really wonderful thing. You need more spaces like this. You need, you need workshops. You need people who are willing to, to talk and train to you. And really in our highly more indi individualized lives, where do those spaces exist? We think that we have issue. We find a way how to solve it by talking with others, making working groups, discussions, everything. For example, do we want to buy Hoovers, you know? Because honestly, that was an interesting discussion. Do we want to have, let's say, four Hoovers for all of 24 flat, or we want to have each flat on Hoover, you know? Actually, Hoover, the Henry Hoovers, they're quite expensive. It's like 150 pounds per piece, which is a quiet lot. You know, I, I, would, I would say 50, not 150, let's say. Compromise, uh, one Hoover per very two flats. So we have James, James the Hoover, which is between our flat and the neighbor flat. Interesting thing about cooperatives is that everyone's cooperating. So everyone's doing everything together or quoting High School Musical, we are all in this together. General meeting is basically the, the space where we make the main decisions, the important decisions and where we update so what happens at the general meetings, apart from the updates, is also proposals. So new things are, are proposed, uh, maybe changes. It does never happens that there's an, 106 members there, although every member is invited. There's usually, I don't know, 20, 30 people. And we need a quorum of 25 in order to pass proposals. Um, I think the main principles that most COP co members share are, you know, sustainability, we want to be a sustainable community and just yeah direct democracy like for for the past few years they've been they've been trying basically since the start they've been trying to get as many people as possible involved but that not always successfully when i moved in i felt like the language it was getting used and like very there was like really technical and um i felt disempowered and i couldn't really like get involved in the conversations easily i couldn't just sort of go into a meeting and sort of like click into it like i'm studying a university and like um i could kind of like engage with it but if i was um sort of like um if i wasn't at a higher educational level i wouldn't be able to participate in the conversation i just wouldn't i wouldn't be able to understand you know people don't get involved in politics because all the jargon and mm. stuff and people don't get involved people aren't interested i think the co-op has really established itself as a good model for cheap housing and a lot of people think that they can become members of the co-op um and you know, just be here for cheap housing. But that's, you know, that if we offer cheap housing, we have to be able to 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 work for it. I think certainly, especially with the work sharing plan, I think that it's, you know, the situations are going to look a lot more dif different. And, uh, you know, there's gonna be less frustration, I think. <laughs> yeah. The work sharing plan comprises of a booklet of roles and this booklet of roles has 61 roles that we think are necessary for the running of the co-op. Basically a, a plan to share the work amongst the members equally so that the work, the amount of work that is required to run the co-op doesn't just fall on the shoulders of like 20 or 30 people, which is what's been happening most of the time. If it's just a minority um, part, like participating in the cooperative activities, mm -hmm. isn't it? some kind of representative um, democracy anyway because it's just the minority it's not the whole yeah i, I do agree with that um, and that's why i was sort of like interested in having a default decision because for me it's the only way it works all our operational decisions would be made out of the working groups and then we'd have less general meetings maybe once every three months because at the moment we try to do all the decisions at that big meeting and more consensus is proven as large groups of people cannot make decisions together or they can really badly and if they do they need lots of time to do it i believe that yeah you'd have to have um 
an obligation to sign, maybe a social contract to sign, I'm going to do five hours a week to stay here. And if that doesn't happen, maybe if you don't, if you don't do anything for the whole year, then maybe your your tenancy isn't renewed for the year after. I believe that's the way it would have to go for me. But um, that's not the popular opinion right now in the club. So. Yeah, we don't want to force people to cooperate at the moment because we're just, you know, somebody pointed out that that might lead to some sort of like policing or like the establishment of like a cooperative police within the the, the club. Our stance, our explicit stance is we want to be free from hierarchies. We don't want to have hierarchies within the cooperative. But as a result of low participation, like in the end, power is concentrated in, in the hands of fewer people. And that's just because it's mostly the people that do more more of the work. So if you're involved with more things and you get to you you have more knowledge than others, then you you finally, you know, eventually you get more power than others. That's what we call, you know, informal hierarchies. Like how how is it successful if people if people are not participating? I think the success of the corps relied very heavily on um some very passionate people you know like despite all the frustration that i that i mentioned before we are always able to overcome that when it arises just because we enjoy what we do and uh, i really enjoy you know like going to two or three meetings a week um and and just taking work that i that i should do in my in my own free time yeah so so yeah, at the end the frustration is just you know it's just part of it sometimes um, it's one of those odd questions that you ask. <laughs> um, I don't know, it's just a place where you feel like you can let your vulnerabilities really be visible, where you can be honest about how you're feeling. And that's basically what I'm describing as really just a property. Um, just, you know, like a supportive environment where people try and be, you know, just try and start and strive not to be judgmental toward, towards other and yeah, just help you be confident and you know, accept you for whatever you are. And yeah, that's it. So I'm 